They're everywhere. We've all seen them. Many of us even own one, the PC. Ally and friend when they work, enemy and nemesis when they don't. But most problems we blame on our computers can be easily remedied, and in some cases, avoided altogether. How? Well, let's see. In order to help you understand how to maintain or upgrade your PC, it's important to begin by opening it up and identifying some of the main components. Now, before you either start throwing things at me or start tearing into your own computer, there are a couple of things you should know. First, opening up a PC is not as frightening as it sounds. And second, there are some definite tips and procedures to follow which can make the whole process relatively easy. Hi, Diane. Hello. I hear you're taking some computer classes. Yes, I am. Seems the more I learn about computers, the more I want to learn about them. It's kind of fun. I know what you mean. You know, one of the best ways to learn about computers is to open one up. What? Me open up a computer? I don't think so. Hey, many people react the same way. In fact, most, like yourself, would never even consider opening up this mysterious little box. But there's nothing like a little hands-on training. It won't bite, you know. I know. I just didn't think it was practical. Ever had a problem with your computer? Well, sure. Who hasn't? Well, what could be more practical than being able to fix it? Look, Mr. Michaels, I really don't think I'm up to tackling this today. I'll tell you what, Diane, I'll make you a deal. We'll open up your PC and go through some basics. If you don't think it was worth it when we're all done, I'll buy you lunch. Hmm. There's got to be a catch. Sure. If I'm right, you buy. What do you say? <laughs> sure. Why not? Great. Hey, I'll go get my tools. Why don't you clear off your desk so we can use it as a workspace? You got it. The first thing we need in order to do the job right is the proper set of tools. These consist of medium and small Phillips head screwdrivers and medium and small flat head screwdrivers, all very useful when disassembling and reassembling the computer, as well as mounting add-on cards. Tweezers, useful for picking up any small parts which may have been dropped. A small jar, even a clean coffee cup, perfect for keeping track of any screws or other small parts. Do you have a notebook here? I think so. Yes, Good. I do. You can keep a journal of all the work you do on your PC, such as maintenance, system configuration and repairs, or making notes and drawings to help you reassemble the computer when you're done. A pencil, so you can write in your notebook, but also helpful for setting configuration switches. And finally, a small brush for cleaning the fan, its housing, and exhaust. You may also need a medium-sized hex screwdriver, just in case your computer uses hex nuts on the back. Some people like to use compressed air or computer vacuums. Since the vacuums don't really work that well, you may just want to save money by purchasing a can of compressed air from a camera store to blow debris away. You should be able to purchase any of these tools at a local hardware store and be able to put your toolkit together for less than $15. Most computer stores sell kits like this. The tools may be a little more expensive, but they come with this storage case, which helps you keep track of all your tools. And you can be sure that none of these tools are magnetized. Magnetized? Yeah. You can never use magnetized tools around your PC. Magnetic fields can damage the hard drive, the floppy disks, and possibly other components. Now, Diane, you've got to promise me at least half an hour of uninterrupted time so we can concentrate on our work here, all right? I promise. It's important, because it's incredibly difficult to come back to a desktop full of screws, cables, and parts, and try to remember where everything goes. Let's begin here by running Check It. What is that? It's a diagnostic program. It can tell me all kinds of things about your PC. Right now, I'm mainly interested in two things. 
the system configuration report, and the CMOS table. Oh, just type check it at the A prompt. I'm going to print them out because they'll be important to us later on when we get inside the computer. It says here you have an AD286 processor, 512K of memory, a CGA video adapter, a hard disk, a floppy disk, and some serial and parallel ports. Now before you do anything else, make sure everything is turned off. Oh. Then unplug the PC from the wall. Unplug the power cable from the PC. Disconnect the monitor and set it aside. But what about all these cables? Oh, those are the cables for the keyboard, the mouse, the monitor, and the printer. Hey, before you go any further, you better start using your notebook. And label each cable as you remove it. Well, this one won't come out. Use one of the small screwdrivers to loosen the screws. Now, gently rock the cable from side to side and pull it out. But be gentle. You don't want to damage any of the delicate pins or break the connector. Now we're ready to take off the cover. I don't think I'm ready for that. Of course you are. All you have to do is determine which screws are holding the cover on. There can be as many as five screws, one at each corner and one in the middle at the top. Since there are all kinds of different PCs in the market, the safest bet is to look for a set of screws around the outer edge of the back of the PC. These are probably the ones holding the cover on. Like these three here? You got it. You'll see other screws on the back, but these are usually keeping things like the power supply in place. Don't remove those, or you'll probably hear a thump inside the computer. easy. The right tools, the right screws. What's next? Hey, the fun is just about to begin. Go ahead, remove the cover. <laughs> Most covers simply slide all the way forward and then off. But you may find variations. <laughs> Some may require a slight liftoff, while others may need to be pulled straight up. In any case, be patient, go slowly, and don't force anything. Nice going. Oh, my gosh. Don't worry. This is quite common, especially inside PCs that have never been opened up. Dirt and dust accumulate inside and have no way of escaping. When it gets really bad, it can shorten your PC's life. But don't worry about that now. We'll clean it later. As you can see, there are a number of cables and wires crisscrossing here. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to snag them when removing or replacing the cover. Now, let's take a look around inside. This is the power supply. There's high voltage inside here, but don't worry about touching the outside. Just never open it up. These do tend to fail occasionally, but if that happens, simply replace it. There's nothing you can fix here anyway. This is the floppy disk drive. These are always connected with a single ribbon cable and power supply cable, and they're usually solidly mounted on the side with a few screws. Since the ribbon and power cables can work themselves loose, Check to make sure they're fully seated and plugged in all the way. In fact, if you've ever had an intermittent disk drive problem, this may solve it. Most drives look pretty much alike. Whether you have a five and a quarter or three and a half inch drive, they're usually all found in the same area. The way to make sure what type of floppy disk drive you have is to check your configuration report. Well, why is that important? Well, so you know what type of disk you can use. See? You have a 1.2 megabyte floppy uh -huh. and a 40 megabyte hard drive. 
The hard disk drive is usually mounted in the same area as the floppy drives. It can have either one or two ribbon cables and a power supply cable attached to it. Again, be sure all cables are properly seated and plugged in all the way. Why all this empty space? The PC has been designed to allow you to expand according to your needs. These are called expansion slots. If you have expansion cards in any of these slots, make sure they're fully seated by pushing them firmly into the slot. If they're not screwed into place, find a screw and fasten them down. Since the external cables on the back of the computer may jostle them loose, it's a good idea to have them securely in place. This board, with all of its chips, cards, slots, and sockets, is affectionately known as the motherboard. This is where everything happens. Now, you don't have to know about all the components, but it's a good idea to know what the motherboard looks like and what it consists of. One of the main areas on the motherboard is the RAM chip area. This is where all the memory is located. Sometimes, if you're getting system error messages, or if Check It reports a bad memory chip, it's a good idea to make sure all the chips are securely seated. This may solve the problem. So if I wanted to add more memory, is this where it would go? That's right. You could expand the computer's memory until all these sockets were full, or you could add memory cards. Other areas to note include the location of the BIOS chips, which contain the information that makes PCs compatible with one another. Then there's the processor or CPU, which is a big chip. You can identify it by a number that usually ends in 86 or 88. The math coprocessor, or NPU, is also a large chip near the processor. Typically, like on your system, there's a socket here which allows you to add one later. Any one of these may need to be replaced, added, or upgraded at some time. So knowing where to look and what to look for can save you time and money down the road. And here's the battery. It's a good idea to know whether it's the type that can be changed or whether it's permanently soldered in. On ATs like yours, it's the permanent type, so you shouldn't have any problem. On XTs, it would be a card, like this. This removable type battery tends to wear out every few years, so you may have to replace it someday. Now, let's get on with the cleaning, which is why we opened your computer up in the first place. Right. I almost forgot about that. Except all of this is still a little bit intimidating to me. Well, maybe so. But remember, to do basic maintenance, you don't have to understand how to build one of these Good. or how the components work. I just want you to see how to get the most out of your PC by keeping it running in tip-top condition. Kind of like changing the oil in my car? <laughs> well, something like that, only it's a lot cleaner job. First of all, static electricity can seriously damage components. If you're going to be working inside your PC, be sure to remove your jewelry, try to wear cotton clothing, and always ground yourself. Well, how do I ground myself? Here, just reach over and touch the computer case on any metal part. Metal? That should do the trick. But I didn't feel anything. Well, you normally won't, but the chips might. Hmm. Wherever you spot a buildup of dust, blow it away with your compressed air. But watch where you're blowing. You don't want to blow dirt into areas you could damage, like your floppy drives. You can use your brush around these housings, but don't use it around the chips. Two other important areas to keep clean are the fan area on the power supply and the exhaust vents on the back or front of the computer. Dirty fans and clogged exhaust systems contribute to heat buildup, and since heat is a computer's worst enemy, it's important to keep them operating cleanly. There, that looks much better. Once you're satisfied that you've properly cleaned your PC, and you've checked to make sure that all chips, boards, and cables are properly plugged in and seated, you're ready to replace the cover, plug in your external devices, and get back to work. Well, wait a minute, though. I, I still have a couple more questions. Like what? Did I miss something? Oh, no, not at all. But what if I wanted to do a little bit more than just clean the inside of my computer and check the cables? You mean like adding memory or installing a modem card? No, 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 nothing that complicated. I'm not ready to tackle that yet. I'm talking about simpler things, like a clock that's always wrong when you turn on the computer. Sounds like your battery is bad. Remember when I told you we might need our check-it printouts later? Mm -hmm. Here is a perfect example. When you replace the battery on ATs, 
you usually have to re-enter the CMOS configuration. Then this printout can be a lifesaver. But I'm talking about XTs. I, the problem that I'm having is with my PC at home. With those, it's easier. You just have to replace the battery. Because everything is set with dip switches, you don't lose anything when the battery goes dead. For an XT, all you have to do is purchase a replacement battery and reinstall it. But if your AT ever had this problem, that would be a job best left to a qualified technician. Hi, guys. Hi, Marcy. Uh, Marcy Thompson, I'd like for you to meet Mr. Michaels. Mr. Michaels, this is Marcy Thompson. Nice to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Say, Diane, word has it you're becoming quite the computer expert. Well, I wouldn't say that. Of course she is. Well, she knows more about PCs now than... And perhaps ever... I ever cared to know. Nonsense. <laughs> We're just getting started here. Well, I gotta hand it to you, Di. There's no way you get me to open one of those up. I have a hard enough time just keeping my keys from sticking. <laughs> Can you help me fix it? Why, sure. She'd be happy to teach you how to clean your keyboard. I would. Sure, it's easy once you know how. I think the key here is once you know how. <laughs> Don't worry. Let's get started here by putting the top back on the PC. Madam, would you care to do the honors? Why not? I've still got a lunch writing on this deal. Well, let's see. It should go back on the same way that it came off, right? Just remember the precautions. Don't snag any cables and take it easy. Once the cover's in place, take the screws from your jar and screw them into place. Don't make them too tight, though. Remember, you'll want to do this again sometime. Now reattach all of your cables according to your notes and numbering scheme. Okay. One. Yes. Finally, plug the power cable into the PC first. then into an outlet. Now go ahead and fire up the system. <laughs> it works! Of course it does. Don't sound so surprised. Oh, I'm sorry, it's just that I've never done anything like this before kind of fun when you know how well this is great guys but what about my keyboard oh right Marcy sorry about that is cleaning the keyboard part of PC maintenance also of course it is anything that's vital to the PC system should be checked and maintained it all adds up to preventing problems and saving money now what seems to be the problem Marcy well see for yourself Sometimes I'm not even sure it works right myself, but if you're going to make me take it apart... Don't worry, Marcy. Even I know my limitations. Keyboards aren't designed to be easily opened up and worked on. However, I have a few tips that might help. First of all, if you think your keyboard isn't working properly, try checking the connections. Sometimes these can work loose and cause the keyboard to appear to be malfunctioning. Also, many keyboards have switches on the bottom so you can use them on either XT or AT type systems. If the switch is in the wrong position, the keyboard will act strange, beep, or not work at all. Be sure to check this. Of course, the most common problem is simply keeping the keyboard clean. This is the type of maintenance that should be done frequently. Begin by turning off your PC. Then clean the keyboard surface and keypads by using any appropriate plastic cleaner. Computer stores carry cleaners such as Kodak Screen and Keyboard Cleaner. It's perfect for this type of cleaning. And all you have to do is follow the directions on the back of this card. Clean the top of the keys with a lint-free cloth and the cleanser. For the hard-to-reach spots, 
You can use one of these swabs. Huh. Then use a brush and your compressed air to dislodge debris from under the keys. Push down on each row of keys as you go. That wasn't so hard. No, not at all. But what if my key still sticks even after all of that? If you still have a stuck key, try flossing the keyboard with the edge of a lint-free cloth. You mean uh, something like this? Right under the corner there. Why don't you give it a try now, Marcy? Great. Will you excuse me for a minute? Certainly. Can you think of any other things that might make life miserable for a PC user? Oh, sure. Well, I can think of plenty of things. Uh, a printer that won't print. A mouse that won't... Mouse? <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at those, too. Shall we? There are only a few items on the printer which need to be covered under basic maintenance. Just like your PC, printers come in all shapes and sizes. However, if you understand these basics, it's easy to apply them to most standard printers. First, turn it off, and then remove the cover. Usually it'll just snap out, but if you're not sure how to do this, refer to your owner's manual. Do you see the paper particles, dust, and lint inside here? Ugh. Looks worse than the inside of my PC. This is common after the printer's been in use. Our task is to remove this debris, since a buildup of these particles increases the chances of getting something between the printhead and the paper. First, remove the printer ribbon. Then you can choose your cleaning method. One method is to vacuum it out, but perhaps the easiest and most desirable way is to use your brush and compressed air. Next, check to make sure that the carriage rail has some lubrication on it. The printhead travels on this rail, so if it dries out, it can cause character overlap or a broken carriage. Carefully place a few drops of 3-in-1 oil on the rail, and move the printhead slowly back and forth for even distribution. Don't get oil on the paper paths or it'll smudge the paper. Be sure to use an oil that'll flow, not grease. What's the difference? Well, the carriage has a porous bearing in it, which helps to absorb and distribute the oil along the rail. Grease will just clog it up. Oh. How often do I need to do this? Oh, if your owner's manual doesn't specify frequency, every two or three months will do under normal use. Some printers contain black rubber rollers, like a typewriter's roller. This, too, needs to be cleaned periodically. Just rub platen cleaner over the surface with a lint-free cloth. This will remove ink and particles clogging the porous surface of the platen and will prevent it from drying out. Always use a proper platen cleaner, which can be purchased at most computer or stationery stores. Never use isopropyl alcohol or cleaners such as 409 for cleaning the platen. Well, what's wrong with alcohol or 409? Isopropyl alcohol will harden the surface. 409 will soften it and make it sticky. Once you're done cleaning the printer, replace the printer ribbon and cover. That should do it. Of course, since you've taken the time to clean your printer, you should consider buying a dust cover. This will help keep the printer clean and prevent serious damage due to accidental spills. Like coffee? <laughs> you know, Mr. Michaels, you make all of this sound so easy. But it is easy. There's no reason why you can't do the same thing to your printer now that you know how. Now, you also mentioned a mouse that wouldn't, uh, mouse. <laughs> How's that for being technical? Well, as I told you before, you don't have to know how to build a PC. 
That goes for knowing all the technical terms, too. Just following these tips puts you miles ahead of the ordinary PC user. I'm convinced. What's next? The mouse. The mouse. After you. Thank you. You know, these little critters are pretty durable. But like all the other devices we've covered, you can extend their lives just by following these simple tips. There are two basic types of mouse, mechanical and optical. Since the only thing that can happen with the optical mouse is that the red lights get blocked, simply make sure that nothing gets in between the light and its special mouse pad. That means take special care to keep the lens and the pad clean. The mechanical mouse has a few more things to watch out for. Mechanical mice rely on a rubber ball and rollers. To clean the rubber ball, simply pop open the bottom and the ball will drop out. The ball is covered with a rubber material similar to that of a platen on a printer, so it should be cleaned with the same type of cleaner. Again, don't use isopropyl alcohol or 409, since you don't want to harden or soften the porous surface. Now, look inside this cavity here. What do you see? Three small rollers. Actually, three small, very dirty little rollers and some dust. Right you are. Now, the dust can be blown out, but the rollers won't come clean that easily. A good trick is to rub a Q-tip or pencil eraser on them. Then turn the mouse over and gently tap the gunk out. Once you've cleaned these parts, put the mouse back together and place it on its mat. Of course, as with any device, preventive maintenance starts with cleanliness. It doesn't do much good to clean the mouse if the surface it contacts is dirty. Make sure your mouse pad is clean. And then keep the mouse and pad covered when not in use, just like your printer. I can't believe it. All of this stuff used to seem so intimidating. You mean that's it? Not quite. Brad, what are you doing here? Well, I heard you're becoming the resident computer expert here, so I thought I'd pick your brain. Well, pick away, Brad, but I'm not an expert. I'm just learning the basics, you know, how to clean a printer, how to change a battery, how to locate the major components mm -hmm, on a PC, mm -hmm. things like that. Can you solve an error message for me? Don't talk to me. This is the expert. But you're getting there. <laughs> Mr. Michaels, I'd like you to meet Brad Stevens. Brad, Mr. Michaels. Pleased to meet you. And you. Well, what seems to be the problem, Brad? Oh, come on. <laughs> Ladies first. Oh, lately I keep getting these disk error messages on my screen. Oh, I think my drive is going bad. Not necessarily. Let's take a look at it. If, it's, if this thing goes down, I'll probably have to do like everybody else around here, uh, bite the bullet and send it out for repair. Is he always like this? <laughs> Only under deadline, which is all the time. Well, when was the last time you cleaned your floppy disk? Hmm. What year is this? You know, you're supposed to clean it about every three months, more often in dusty or smoky conditions. Do, do we have to open up the PC to clean them? Well, in the old days, yes. But nowadays, no way. There are two common disc cleaning systems on the market today. One is a wet cleaning kit, the other a dry. Wet cleaning kits, such as this one from Kodak, come with either aerosol or eyedrop solutions. Two or three drops from the eyedropper is enough, while the aerosol is usually a measured spray. Just apply the solution to the cleaning disc and insert the disc into the drive. Would more solution clean better? Well, you should never oversaturate the disc. That'll cause more harm to the drive than good. Now, the dry disc works basically the same way, but it's much less hassle, since you don't have to worry about cleaning solutions. But they're a little harder to find. Now, once the disc has been inserted, type DIR. What's that sound? You'll hear a slight hissing sound as the drive tries to read the disc. Since the disc is not regular media, you'll receive a general failure error message on your screen. Instruct it to retry and continue this procedure three more times. Be sure to record on your disc every time you use your cleaning disc, since it has a limited life. If you use it beyond its recommended life, once again, you may do more harm than good. Also, if you choose to use a wet cleaning system, be sure to wait several minutes before attempting to use the drive. Mm. This will allow time for the alcohol-based solution to completely evaporate. If you don't wait long enough, 
you'll damage your disc and dirty the head again. Great. Hey, Brad, your monitor just went dead. What? Oh, no. Uh, don't panic. Let's think. What could be wrong? Is it all plugged in? Of course it's... Spoken like a pro, Diane. It's always a good idea to make sure your cables and power cords are properly connected. Sometimes cables work loose or are inadvertently bumped out of place, causing a failure. Now, as long as we're at it, let's check out the rest of the monitor. If your monitor is plugged in, but it's cold to the touch, make sure it's been turned on. If it's warm, but there isn't any image on the screen, check the brightness and contrast controls. Now, these controls are located in different places on different monitors, so you're going to have to find yours. The power, brightness, and contrast controls can be located anywhere externally on the monitor, even behind a panel, like on your TV. Usually, these controls are labeled with icons. The full circle, half solid icon is the contrast control. The sun is the brightness control. The first thing you should do is turn the contrast all the way up. Hey, you fixed it. <laughs> Apparently, someone turned the contrast level all the way down. Hey, at least that's all that was wrong. Hmm? Once you have the contrast all the way up, you can set your brightness. Then back off your contrast slightly. The combination of these settings is a personal preference, but generally, neither should be left turned all the way up. Monitors don't last forever. However, Brad may have accidentally discovered a way to extend the monitor's life. Any guesses? Uh, what? Unplug it? No, come on, think. What else was wrong with this monitor? Just that the contrast was turned all the way down. Right. I see. So if you're going to leave the monitor for a while, you should turn the contrast and brightness settings all the way down. Exactly. That'll help extend the life of the monitor, as well as prevent annoying burn-in of ghost images. But, but why not just turn it off? Well, turning it on and off is okay, especially if you're going to leave it for a long time. But if you're frequently leaving and returning to your display, you may want to purchase a screen blanking program, which will automatically dim your screen after a few minutes of inactivity. Mm. Oh, yes. Thanks for the reminder, Brad. Huh? The final step in monitor care, cleaning it. Oh, yeah. Right. Cleaning a computer monitor is similar to cleaning a TV. But be aware of a few additional precautions. Never use Windex on the screen, because it might remove the anti-glare coatings that come on some monitors. Mm. The proper way to clean the screen is with the monitor off. Then use the Kodak cleaner we used earlier with a lint-free cloth. The case can be cleaned with the same type of cleaning solutions used on the PC in the printer cases. Mm. Well, that's about it. We've covered a lot of ground. Opening up a PC and identifying the components, changing the battery, cleaning the mouse, cleaning the keyboard, the printer, cleaning the floppy drives, and adjusting the monitor. Basic PC maintenance. What next? Well, I think it's time for me to leave. Already? But we're just getting started. Hey. You guys are the pros now. Besides, I have a luncheon engagement I don't want to miss.